Well, welcome everyone. Um, thank you all for coming. We certainly appreciate the cities of San Joaquin and Orange Cove for hosting our event. Um, I'm Leanne Eager, if some of you don't know me, um, President and CEO of the Economic Development Corporation. And we were pleased to be able to get an RCDI grant to be able to come out to your community um, and really do some workshops about, you know, how we can start working together better. Um, I especially want to thank PG&E for hosting our event uh, today. And I'd like to turn it over to um, Josh Townsend if you'd like to say a, a few welcoming remarks to the group. Yes. No. Well, thank you, everyone. Let me let me address this so you can see me. Uh, I'm Josh Townsend, as as Leanne mentioned before, PG&E, and I run the Economic Development Department uh, at PG&E in San Francisco. Um, we are just so happy to be here. You know, we've been doing a few of these throughout our service territory, and we want to continue doing these. And we really think it's a great way to to show how not only we're working with your local entities, but also on a state and a, and a regional wise as well. So thank you for having us. Thank you for, um, for for hosting us, and it's great how these kind of interline really well on, on, on your your grants and kind of what we've started doing as, as an entity and partnering with outlet. So thank you so much, and I'm looking forward to um, talking to you all about economic development in the region. Thank yeah. you. And before I introduce Esther, maybe we could go around the room and everyone can introduce yourselves, and if you could talk really loud so the folks in Orange Cove can hear us, and then we'll switch over to Orange Cove. So we start over here with Tim. Tim, we're back to head up, Alan. Patrick McGuire, Bill Drew. We already met Josh. My name is Bill Drew. I welcome you here. Thanks for having us. Our newest city manager. Welcome, welcome. Thanks for having me here. I'm not going to be here. I'm not going to be here. We have Esther over here in the corner, that I most of you. <laughs> and if we could have the folks in, in Orange Cove introduce yourselves. Gabriel Jimenez, the Mayor of the City of Orange Cove. June Brockmarker, City Clerk, Orange Cove. Sam Escobar, City Manager, City of Orange Cove. Hello, Leanne, Glenda Hill, Orange Cove. Sylvia <laughs> Snow, City Chaplain. Juanita Stevenson, EDC. Victor Bidiesca, EDC. Tyler Proper, PG&E. Director Vinbolski, Councilman Orange Cove. Inez Castillo, Planning Commission. Ralph Pardo, Orange Cove City Councilman. Dan Spear, City of Sanger. Manuel Ferreira, Chamber of Commerce, Orange Cove. Tony Pacheco, uh, Councilman from Sanger. Hmm. That's, That's everybody? <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to you all. Um, and. Hello, Mayor. Nice to see you again. Hello. It's been a while. Yes. Yeah. Nice to see you too, Leah. <laughs> and at this time, I'd like to introduce Esther Cuevas. She's going to tell us a little bit about the RCDI grants and while we're all here. Thank you, Leanne. Hello, Orange Cove. Hello, Esther. <laughs> Hi, thank you and welcome. I um, just wanted to go a little bit over the RCDI. Um, again, this is a series of workshops that we'll, we will be having throughout uh, the year, um, covering many different uh, topics. We had our first uh, workshop last month um, that covered the economic development basics. Um, today we're doing an economic roundtable. Um, the next workshop will be um, on covering incentives, discussing business attraction and marketing, We'll also have a business expansion and retention workshop, um, and we'll have a couple of workshops on increasing technology use. And then our final workshop will be on um, really doing a wrap-up and looking at what are these tools that we have learned about and how can we implement some of these tools in our cities. And so we really look forward to providing um, information to our cities and um, bringing these tools to you. Um, as we continue with um, the series of workshops, we'll be doing more of a drill down on what are the services that the EDC provides and our partners and how we can best work together. Um, this is an interactive workshop, so I welcome all of you to please, if you have any questions in Orange Cove, you have your facilitators, uh, Juanita and Victor, um, please let them know if you have a question. They'll be uh, kind enough to interrupt our presentations here, and uh, we can make sure that your questions are answered. 
Um, and then, of course, here in the city of San Joaquin, um, you know, please raise your hand if you have any questions. We want to make sure that we answer any questions you may have. So with that, we will start with our first presentation. Um, we will have uh, Joshua Townsend um, do his first presentation on pg &E. So um, with that, Joshua. Um, <laughs> so, so first and foremost, you know, I do want to I do want to emphasize that this is a really an open forum. We really want to make this as interactive as possible, less so of me and and the rest of us just really talking at you. So, if you have any questions about anything that any of us are talking about, or if you or just want to interject, please feel free to. And I know there's a there's a uh, moderator there that can in Orange Cove that can jump in and, and really you know, um, say, hey, wait, we have a question here, so please feel free to do so, because nothing's worse than being talked at about, you know, a pretty interesting subject. So please feel free to jump in at any point, and we, we'd, be, we'd be really glad to talk. So, so we as a company uh, about a year and a half ago really decided, hey, what are, what are we doing in, in the economic development world out there? We need to get more involved. How can we get more involved? We touch half or three-quarters of the state and the population. How do we get more involved? We looked at ourselves. We didn't have much of an economic development group. We did years ago, but we really did not have much. So um, so fortunately or unfortunately for all of you, they brought me on to really try to build that from, from the ground up, and we're really going to start talking about that. All of you are very fortunate. You have actually one of the best reps um, at pg e that really handles economic development with Sam Malloy. So, Sam, you, you are... These, this group is very lucky. I can't say that with all these presentations I'm doing. I have to kind of, um, you know, yeah, and, and that's, yeah. But anyways, I won't get into that. Okay. Oh, perfect. So so we really put together um, some interesting items and, and things that I've kind of built from the ground up. Well, first and foremost is the Executive Leadership Roundtable, which we're at today. Um, and I'll go into a little more details on that. There's also the Economic Development Rate, which I know a lot of you have been hearing about because it's very important for, for our customers. Um, and that's in front of the commission right now. We also have our general rate case, um, and we requested quite a few dollars through our general rate case for economic development and our economic vitality grant program. These are the four things that I'm really focusing on right now um, in going into the end of 213 and the 214, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, about each one of these, these items. Um, so the Executive Leadership Roundtable, that's you here today, and, and we collaborated with CalEd. Thank you, Gerbax, for, for your great support, and the, and the local cities and, and counties. Um, uh, and, and we really wanted to focus, focus on the local economic feel, you know, and how each and every one of these large, small, and medium-sized organizations work together. And we really, we re what we're really doing is we're really making them area-specific. So we work with your local EDOs, your local EDCs, your local electeds, um, your city managers, and we really say, what do you need from us? And Gerbax and I then go back to the go to back to the the the, the, um, the board and we call up um, GoBiz and say, okay, this community needs um, needs our help, or they need some they they need something. How can we get out there? How can we reach the people? How can we really talk about economic development? And that's really what we're focused. You know, we review issues, we talk about best practice, practices, and we, we want to really overall improve the business plan, you know, through jobs, through training, through through whatever tools are out there, because so many communities are don't know about the tools that are available to them. And that's why we're bringing not only GoBiz here, but Calad to really talk about those tools and how you can utilize those so we don't leave those, leave anything behind. <clears throat> And ultimately, what we want to do is have six roundtables in 213, but I think we're going to push that up, and Gerbeck always pinches me when I say I want to do eight to ten this year. But I'm, gonna, I'm really going to push for that um, um, going forward. So here's something I know that everybody's wondering about. Where is this economic development rate? Um, at the end of, of 2013, our, our economic development rate expired. And what the economic development rate was, was it was a rate that, we could use for attraction and a retention customers um, to keep them in our service territory or bring them to our service territory. And it would be a 12% a discount for any of those companies that we could, we could either bring in or retain. That expired in December of, of, last, of last year. Earlier in the year, we actually submitted a new economic development that is another 12% for five years. But we added to that also a enhanced economic development rate. 
which applied to which applied to counties that were 125 uh, percent below the the sorry, I'm sorry above the unemployment the unemployment mark of the state. So if you qualified as a county for that, which which um, which this county does, you would be eligible for this um, for this rate. You'd have to have an out-of-state location option. You couldn't you you couldn't you couldn't just say, hey, I'm here, PG and E. Can we have that rate? No, you have to have an out-of-state. You have to prove that. And energy costs obviously is a key issue. And where that's at right now, we just got a proposed decision from. And when I say proposed decision, that doesn't mean a final decision from the commission is we got a proposed decision from the commission that actually that actually supported the 12% rate. So we are gonna so it looks like we are gonna have a, a rate that you get a flat 12% if you're trying to attract or retain. Um, but the enhanced rate had some had a, had a few different things to it that the commission recommended. They they recommended that it be that you get the 12% up front, but then you then there's a certain formula that we would take in, in, into account. To get the get up to 35 percent, so you could be anywhere along anywhere from 12 to 35 percent of a discount, but that amount you would have to pay, you would get as a refund at the end of the year. So we don't really like that idea. We're going to propose a couple other things, um, and we're we're working with with some of the local entities that you all have worked with on um, how do we reshape that because we do feel that we need certainty, and I know all of you know it's trying to bring in business, trying to attract business, trying to keep them here. We need certainty, and that's really what we're we're going to try to do. And and we're we're actually next week um, going to be filing our opinion on it, and then the commissioner commissioners can actually vote on this. Um, the first available date is September nineteenth, so there's a possibility at the end of September that we'll have an announcement that we have a new economic development rate, right? which will be hugely useful for you all trying to retain, attract um, businesses to come into the the service territory. Yes. Yep. 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 What he thinks is appropriate, and that goes to the commissioners. And the commissioners then have it, it, it has to sit for 30 days. All the parties make their comments on that, and then after 30 days, the commissioners themselves can decide to yes, we like exactly what the proposed decision was, or we want to make a few tweaks here and there, and we approve, or we don't like it at all, we reject, and we're going to go back to the drawing board. So. We have a very strong feeling. Mean, we, we have a very strong feeling that there will be that, that they are eager to vote on this. And now we're just toying with format of how the enhanced rate looks. So that's really what the discussion is right now. Is how how do we make that enhanced rate more attractive? Because twelve, I mean, twelve is great, but we want to we want a more certain larger amount of front, especially for the for the reasons that are that are economically defined. So this time, twelve is definite. But on top of that, I want to Yes, yeah, so so I never want to say definite with the commission, obviously, but that is that is what they the the, the, the proposed decision does support that. So it does look like, and I keep my fingers crossed, and I don't want to say this too loud, but it, it is positive that the it does look positive that the commission will approve at least the twelve percent. Another thing great about that is the twelve percent. We had some problems with the twelve percent before because they have had you do a year a yearly true up. And people wouldn't, and businesses wouldn't actually get the 12%. Well, the way it's formed now, you get a flat 12%. It's a, the way it's supported right now is you get a flat 12%, no yearly true ups, just a flat 12% over a five year period. So, so that's a great addition to, to one. But again, it, it, it's supported by the CD. We support it. All the parties support it. So that does look like, um, that'll be something that we, we, we hopefully will get. Again, I don't want to say that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Josh, we have a question here in Orange Cove. Okay, Orange Cove. once this has been approved and we've been given the goal, when does this five-year period start? So, so how? Oh, sorry. Oh, well, go ahead. So what it? So how it's looked before, and it looks very similar to that in this new, um, in the new um, proposal, is that you have. 
you have two years to qualify. You, once you qualify the rate, you have two years to use it. And once you start taking service, you have five years past that. So you can qualify for it early without, without actually taking any service. But once you start service, then your five years start. Does that help? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. So that's the in the timeline. Now, where we stand, when we say the cost of the uh as the community has the school. I, I, oh yeah. So the question was: Is when, when, when can, um, when can you all once the rate, or when, when, when is, when can you all go out and pitch this rate? You can pitch the rate once the commission says yes, we approve this rate, and we're hoping it's on the 19th. It may take um, a couple weeks to get all of our administration in in order, but it'll it'll go pretty fast once the commission approves. We just what we don't want to see is it being picked back month after month after month. So that's really you know again I we, I I use all my words cautiously because I, I never know what the commission's going to do. But but we've gotten a lot of support from from groups like this from um, from a, from the, from GoBiz and we just had some really good support for it. And, yeah, and Cam's saying that she will be your local contact for all of that information, and you'll you'll see an email probably from her once the decision's been made, and we and we start understanding what the commission has with you. All right. Any questions on that? So. We also every three years have a general rate case where we go and we request um, we request additional funds through through the money we receive from rate payers. <clears throat> in the past, economic development hasn't been a strong focus in the general rate case, but this year we've made it. You know, we've we've made a very strong push for dollars to go strictly towards economic development. And what that means is that <clears throat> what that means is that that will put more bodies in the field, that will strengthen, uh, that will give us some, some, some money to have stronger relationships with our EDOs and EDC partners. It will also give us um, uh, more ability to sponsor some forums, some trains like we're doing today. Um, it also gives us um, the ability to do more marketing and communicating um, about our programs and what we have to offer. Um, we hope to hear about um, how much money is going to be allocated to economic development in early 2014. Um, we, we were hearing February or March, but that will, if we do get some money for that, you will definitely see that right away, and we're hoping to add more camelloys to the field, although we can never replicate her. I understand that. <laughs> we are going to actually clone her. So, um, so, um, but, um, but no, so it's, 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 it's exciting because we haven't, we haven't requested many dollars in the past, and the commission's very supportive of us. Um, requesting these dollars for economic development. That's a good question. So, so the question was: Is how will the how will the allocation of dollars? What will the allocation of dollars look like? And what it will it'll it'll actually be? I I actually work hand in hand with the field team, and we allocate it pretty evenly. Usually towards the more harder hit reason, regions, we we. We, we try to allocate more because we know those are the most, um, you know, those are the most needy regions. And so we'll be doing a lot of work. And, you know, since Cam doesn't know anything about the region, I think you guys are, no, I think you guys are safe. Um, but, no, we will. Well, we, we take a very close look. And the regions that are hit the most, are hit hardest with the, with the economic downfall, we really focus on those. So, so you can, you can, you can bet we'll be looking at the regions extremely closely, especially this year. The question was: Is through this, through these dollars that we'd be getting for the rate base, would there be any hard dollars that would go to help get businesses here? Um, and the and the answer is is that um, the way that the commission works, it's they don't really let us give dollars to incentivize to come in. Like here's a here's a here's Twenty grand for you to come in. So we can't do. We can't use. You know, we can't get blocks of money to bring customers in. Our way that we're doing it is through the economic development rate that we filed for, because you do get a large upfront cost off of your electric bill. So, so that's kind of how we're able to, and that's how we're able to do that. We also will have grant programs 
that may, you know, that, that local, you know, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But I have, uh, you know, we have, I have, you know, the company has also asked for funding for, um, for some, um, for some, from grant, for some grants given. So that's also an area. It may get cut. I don't know. I hope it doesn't, but that's kind of what that looks like. Any other questions on the, the general rate case? I talked a little bit, we also started the Economic Vitality Grant Program, which most of you already know about. And um, unfortunately, it has already closed. It closed at the end of July. So if, if um, those of you that applied good work, we had um, a huge amount of individuals apply. I mean, organizations apply for this, and it was a huge success. And what we're going to do is be giving um, $25,000 grants to really job creation programs. That's really what we're looking at in this first round of grants. And um, we're looking at, you know, we're looking throughout the board, business attraction, retention, you know, workforce training. And um, it, it's just, a, and, and well, trust me, we'll, get, we'll do this program again next year. Don't worry if you missed it this year. We will, um, we will do it again next year. But the success of this year's is really going to kick us into next year. So we're, we're excited. So be on the lookout for that. I'll have Cam be sure to call you guys right away. Yes. Okay. All right. Absolutely. Great. The comment was is if, um, some of the individuals in the room didn't know about the program. So we need to do better as a company of really touting our programs. Thank you for bringing that up. Absolutely. Um, um, yes, and, and that is that is the Economic Vitality Grant, and we will be on top of it for next year to let you know when that, when that launches. What was that, Tyler? I heard you mumble something. Uh, normally it's about March, April, right? Yeah, yeah, that's what we're looking at. So, so that's really what we're doing as a company. We look to continue to, you know, add bodies to the field, add workshops, add trainings, and then, and then expand these grant programs. So we will be in touch. Like I said, you have an incredible, incredible person in Pam, and um, we're going to replicate her as much as possible, hopefully going forward in 214. So so thank you all, and um, I think, Leanne, are you next? Are you? All right, I'm going to introduce Leanne. She's going to come up and talk about what we're doing locally. All right, thank you. Okay. So as I said, I'm Leanne Eager, President and CEO of the Economic Development Corporation, and I've been with the EDC for about four years now, started as the COO. And one of the things that I learned during these years is that um, across the state, the Economic Development Corporations come in all shapes and forms and sizes. And so if you're going around the state and you're looking at what other economic development corporations do, um, some of them just do attraction. Some of them do some retention. Um, some do enterprise zone. Um, some work with CG&E. Um, your economic development preparation does all of that. Um, we started off, I think, small a long time ago, and we started looking at what do our cities need, what do our businesses need, and started to add things as we went along. And so now I think we really are a multi-focused organization and really we're focused on what it is that you need from us. Um, as you can see, these are areas of expertise. Um, one of the things that Esther does on a daily basis is she goes out and markets all of you um, around the country and around the world. And there's nobody better, I think, in the entire state than Esther to do that. She attracts um, people that never even thought of Fresno County to come here and look at what we have to offer. We have our Bear Action Network, and most of you have worked with Devin and his team. Um, they're doing um, retention and expansion, and uh, I think for the last five years, it's really been retention. Please, please, whatever we can do to keep our businesses up and running, his team has made sure that we've done how to do that. Lately, we've gotten quite a few expansions in the works, so that's really a good sign for all of us. We collaborate with our local partners, of which there are some right here in the room. I, I think I said this before. I've gone around the country and I've talked about our relationship with cg &E. And places in other parts, I say, you work with your utilities companies? And I said, no, they're wonderful, I swear. They're helping us do all kinds of things. So 
we make sure that whatever local partners we can deal with to make sure that you get what you need, that's our job. Um, and throughout the Central Valley of California, you know, well, that's one of the things I think most of you know. I'm also the chair of the California Central Valley EDC. And there's eight of us, of which Cam is a member. And what happens in the Central Valley, if we can bring more people here and bring attention to what we're doing here in the Central Valley, it helps all of us. If somebody puts a great big giant um, center in Tulare and they have to hire people from our region to work there, that helps all of us. So we make sure we're included in all of the things that are happening in the Central Valley. Um, yes. Um, just so you all know they're in Orange Cove, I got a question already about High Speed Rail. <laughs> um, they're getting there. Um, one of the things that we have found, and I'll talk about High Speed Rail in just a minute, but just to answer that question on whether or not there are our folks to the south of us are on board yet on High Speed Rail, um, they're finally getting to that place now where they see that this is coming. And so what we really need to focus on now is how do we um, really focus on the opportunities and how do we help our businesses that are along the alignment, how do we bring in new business here. Um, <clears throat> I have been working closely with the folks in um, Kings County. And um, I used to say that in Fresno County, I was the queen of high-speed rail, and they called me something a little different in Kings County. Um, but now, now that's changed. Um, now they do call and say, we need your help. You know, our businesses are going to be affected next. Can you come and talk to us about what you all have done in Fresno County to, to prepare for this? So things are changing. And when we get to this place in here, I'll talk a little bit about where we are in high-speed rail. So... Um, I can give you the all and have a heads up before anybody else hears what's going on. Um, oops, I passed this by. We all know what the assets are here in Fresno County. Um, when I, I was just in Atlanta, and when I was talking to them about what we had to offer here, and being in the center of the state, and where we're talking about distribution centers, for instance, and I had all of these businesses in Atlanta talking to me about, oh, well, you know, we do our distribution centers in Southern California and Riverside County. And I said, why? Why? Why would you do that in Riverside County when we're right here in the middle of the state and you can get to Northern and Southern California in one day if you do that here? And I said, you know what? We never thought of the Central Valley of California. But we are now because they are so impacted in Southern California that they can't even get out of Riverside County in three hours, much less get on the other side of the state. So we really are starting to look at what we have to offer, offer here. Um, our agricultural base obviously is huge for us. Um, when we look at um, food processing, I mean, what, a, what better place to do food processing than right here? And you all have a large food processor here. And we're, when we're talking to some of the other companies about can we grow it here? We send it out to get processed, and we bring it back and send it out. Not acceptable. So we're really looking at those kinds of things. As I said, we have our business expansion and retention that we do um, out of the Fresno EDC. And as I said, it really has been retention for quite a few years now, but things are changing. We have three really large expansions that we're looking at right now, um, <clears throat> and that hasn't happened in a long time. And so we're really excited about the things that we can do. You know, Devin and his team go out and talk about, you know, if you're going to expand, um, and we'll talk about enterprise zone later maybe, um, what kinds of incentives you have, and not just state incentives, but also local incentives. What kinds of things that we can help them with our expansion. Enterprise zone. We all know what's happening with the enterprise zone, and um, I don't know if Patrick is going to touch on that, but I will for just a sec. Um, we all know it ends December 31st. The Enterprise Zone as it stands. Um, the EDC has been administering that for Fresno County, and I promise, Mayor, I won't cry this time. Um, we have, um, my team has done an excellent job of making sure that the Enterprise Zone here in Fresno County is the best of the best. Well, they're going to continue to do that when it is what it is for the next one. It's going to be economic development, something? Governor's Economic Development Initiative will start January 1st. Um, we're not exactly sure. We're going to learn on Monday um, what it is that that's going to turn into. So 
will continue to sell that. When we go around the country, we'll continue to talk about what California has to offer and what the new initiatives are. Yes. yes. Absolutely. Yes. And, and what the question was was whether the EDC will continue to assist with Enterprise Zone through December 31st. Um, and absolutely, we're still, we're still the administrators of the Enterprise Zone through that time period and probably after. Um, if someone turns their vouchers in December 31st, we still need to, to enter them. <laughs> we can't do it until midnight and then end. So I'm sure there will be a time period after that to be able to do that too. Um, and then, of course, we'll mark it, whatever the new one is. So we'll continue to do that work, absolutely. It, you know, it is a, what we are telling people, um, if you're hiring people, if you're thinking of hiring people, make sure you do it now before the December 31st, um, because, yes, you'll still be able to use it for the time period. Right, Patrick? Okay, great. Um, the EDC also administers the VISTA, AmeriCorps VISTA, and many of you have used, and we have a VISTA right here, who, um, an old VISTA. <laughs> an old VISTA, yeah. <laughs> and I know it's been, been very successful, and our VISTAs have gone on to do wonderful things after all of you have mentored them, um, right? Gone on to do wonderful things, Matt. Yes. <laughs> Um, and we will continue to do that. We make sure that we administer that program here. And for anybody who doesn't know about the VISTA program, these wonderful people give up a year of their lives to live in poverty and help our communities um, be a better place for all of us. And so if you don't have an AmeriCorps VISTA, please contact us and we can help you with this next round. And our pg and &E Energy Watch program, and this is something that I was talking about when I was talking to people around the state about what we can do um, and how we work with our, our local pg and &E. You know, what we do is we look at what do our, our cities need, what do our businesses need, but what they need is help with that bottom line. You know, how do we keep them in business? And pg and &E came up with this Energy Watch program and said, we can help them. We can help them save on their energy bills. And we're going to we're going to partner with the EDP to get that word out to all of those businesses so that anybody who wants to do this is has that availability. And so PG&E has been wonderful in working with all of us. I know they worked with the city of San Juan too, um, in making sure that we all have that availability. And Esther's attraction department. Um, she and her team and Juanita's over there on that other side. Juanita, um, they. <laughs> The two of them, and plus Lorena now, who's the best up, um, really goes out and sells your community. What they do is miraculous. They work 24 hours a day to make sure that everybody who is interested in starting a new business someplace, and expanding someplace else, and moving parts of their business someplace, they know about Fresno County. They know about all of your communities. And I know her team has made sure that um, they've worked with all of you, so we know what the assets are of your community, so that when she's out there, she can talk about those kinds of things. Um, what she's done is really put together a wonderful marketing program so that um, we have a, a YouTube channel, and if you haven't checked us out, um, please do so. What we did was, instead of sending out emails and saying, here's what's new and here's what we're doing, um, they've been doing it on YouTube. And I know that's been really novel around the state. People have been calling saying, we never even thought of that. How did you guys think of that? But in order to keep people's attention, um, this was a wonderful way to do that. So if you haven't checked it out, make sure you check out Esther the Star. Um, and really doing the marketing of your community. And what she has done is uh, Fresno County Overview, the demographics, the economic profiles of all of your cities. And hopefully you've all gotten those and been able to use those. Um, we take them on all of our trade shows. We take them out on all of our missions to make sure that the rest of the country and the rest of the world really knows what it is that we have to offer here. So um, any suggestions that any of you have about how we can do this bigger and better, make sure you tell us because 
um, we're willing to change what we do to make sure we get the word out for you. And just so you know, Esther was just in Hong Kong. And the reason that Esther got to go to Hong Kong, well, I should have gone, but no, Esther got to go. Uh, the reason Esther got to go to Hong Kong is the folks from the Hong Kong Trade Association were traveling from Napa to Los Angeles, and they were interested in produce. And they weren't stopping in the Central Valley. And so Esther got word of it and said, you know, we'll set that up here for you to be able to look at what we have to offer right here in Fresno County. So I think it was for the moment, right? I think it was like maybe three days before we put together um, an agricultural tour. So we were able to take them out into the field and let them look at what it is that we do. We wanted to do a farm-to-table um, tour for them, which we did. We took them out to sour packing, and they got to see the fields there and then how they packed them, and then we had lunch on, the, on our local food. We took them out to Wolona Foods, where they got to see how they freeze the food and send it out. And then we had 12 local companies that evening to do a tasting, so they were able to go around and, and taste some of our local wares. And all of those companies received orders from the folks from the Hong Kong Trade Association immediately. We got calls saying, oh my gosh, they've already called us and they already want to buy from us. And then about uh, a month later, they wrote us a letter and said, we were so impressed with what Fresno had to offer. We would like to sponsor one of you from the EDC to come to Hong Kong and come to our trade show, and we want to introduce you to all of our other companies. They also sponsored one of our local companies to go out there. So um, someone from your area was able to go, which was wonderful. Um, and Esther was able to show them around and introduce them to the folks there. Esther was a big star there for some reason. She was getting her picture taken. Um, she didn't really understand the language, and she kept signing things, and I think she sold the EDC to them. I'm not sure. Um, she was also there on the day of the typhoon. So she emailed me and said, I landed, but there's a typhoon, and I thought, you know, Typical Esther, she's probably, you know, probably a little storm, and she's calling it a typhoon. So I looked it up online, and there really was a typhoon. The airport was closed about an hour after she got there. They turned off all the electricity. People had to stay inside. I mean, people died. And here was Esther, but I'm fine, really. It's all good. Oh, my God. <laughs> and she continued on with the trade show. Um, but that's really something that we have been doing lately is looking at how do we help our local companies in exporting. How do we connect them to the global economy? Because that is really something that we think is going to be important in these next few years, is our local companies who right now sell locally. And they haven't even thought of, you know, these folks from China and Japan and Hong Kong that we've been bringing through here that say, we really want to buy your produce. We really want to buy the goods that you're making here. Because those folks in Hong Kong said, we don't grow anything. There's nothing here that we grow that we can do. So we want to come there and buy what it is you have there. Well, we're better than Fresno County for them to come and look. So they're going to bring another group out. And we're looking at people from all over the world who are now starting to look at what we have to offer here, and we're doing those connections. So um, make sure you keep up with um, Esther's newsletter and um, so that you know when we have these things coming up next. Yes? And you know, um, there's the the new group, the San Joaquin Rail, um, that's looking at what they can do with that. Because if we can get that short power rail to other places where we can get them to port easily. That's going to be huge for all of you. Yeah. So the next time that the, the San Joaquin Rail Association is having a meeting, I'll make sure you get the information. This was a question about the, the local um, short haul rail that goes up and down the west side and how can we tie into that better and how do we make that work better for all of us. So the other thing that we're doing is high speed rail. Um, some of you may have heard about I'm not sure. Um, and just to give you a, a, a quick update, on high-speed rail. Um, there was a um, judge's ruling recently that said that the high-speed rail authority abused its discretion um, with their 2011 business plan by going forward. Um, there have been some um, reports in the news 
that um, overstated what that meant. It does not stop the high-speed rail. There was no remedy in there that said, because you did that, now you have to stop everything. What it did say was your 2011 business plan was not good enough, but didn't really talk about the 2012 business plan that fixed the majority of those things. So the high-speed rail is continuing. Um, that lawsuit, even though the folks in Kings County got a pat on the back and said, yes, you're right about that, um, it did not stop the rail. So what's happening in downtown Fresno right now, and through from Avenue 17 in Madera to American Avenue in Fresno, is that they are acquiring properties along that route. And there's about 356 properties that are going to be affected by that alignment. And so what the city of Fresno did and the county of Fresno did is um, got a contract with the High Speed Rail Authority and um, what it's going to do is streamline um, the permitting process so when we have to move all of these people around that it doesn't take six months to get through the permitting process, that they do it very quickly. Um, and we also gave the Economic Development Corporation a grant to be able to, a contract to be able to work with all of those folks along the alignment. So what we're doing is helping them find sites. Um, we're also helping and we're advocating on their behalf when they're going through the appraisal process, when they're going through the relocation process. So we're going to have people assigned to all of those 356 folks so that they do have their own advocate in working through this process because it can be really scary. Um, they have purchased about 20 properties so far, um, and some of them have to be purchased quickly. Um, you might have heard on the news that Angelo's um, Burger joint was being torn down. Um, that was a 1950s burger place um, across from the zoo in downtown Fresno. Um, the story was blown way out of proportion. Um, Angelo died about 30 years ago. His son sold it to another family who sold it to another family who sold it to another family. So it really is not more Angelo's. But they were pleased with um, the money that they received from the high speed rail authority. They got $166,000 and they get to go and retire now. They're 85 years old, this couple. So it actually was a good story. Um, but we're helping all of those folks along that alignment. So um, if you know of businesses that are on that alignment, um, make sure you send them our way because we can help them with any of these things. We're also doing um, certification training for companies that want to work on the project. So um, we will be doing some out in the rural communities. I know that initially they were all in downtown Fresno and we had some um, at, in north of town, but we have told the High Speed Rail Authority that we will start doing those out in the rural communities as soon as possible. A uh, question, Leanne? Yes. Okay. Um, on, on the High Speed Rail alignment, it, you're working with them. Does that mean you now have a map showing the uh, the decided upon route? Yes, the, the route from um, Avenue 17 to American Avenue is set. So um, yes, we do have a map that shows that alignment. Now certainly as you go farther south um, into, into Kings County, that hasn't been set yet. If you go up to Madera County, out where the Y is by Chowchilla, that hasn't been set yet. But we know the alignment through Fresno. Is it possible that we could get copies of that map? Well, there is a map on the High Speed Rail Authority website. Um, and if you want to download those quickly, you can. Or you can call William McComas at our office, and, and he, can, he can send you that link. OK, thank you. Sure. Um, and real quickly, most of you know the EDC does um, large events, um, and so if we think there's a pertinent issue that you all need to know about, um, we try to do an event about it and invite all of you to come to those. Um, and you all know about our publica publications. Um, these are the, the latest three. Um, that was my favorite with the balloons going up. Things we're really looking up. And so if you have any questions, we are going to have, after all of us speak, we're going to have a roundtable discussion with additional questions. So um, if you have any questions now, great. If not, we can save them for later. All right. Thank you. Good evening. Patrick McGuire with the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. Happy to be here in San Joaquin and virtually in Orange Cove. 
The governor's office was established by legislation last year carried by uh, Perez, Assemblyman Perez, AB 29. The governor signed the bill in October. Up until that point, we were only operating under an executive order that was uh, started by Governor Schwarzenegger. He pulled together different assets that were doing economic development work in the state, pulled them together so we could try to work with communities. We work with our partners in the field. Um, EDC is one. And uh, we work with EDCs throughout the state. We also work with our major utilities. We report directly to uh, Mike Rossi. He is the governor's special advisor on business and jobs. He's a former um, Bank of America executive. As a matter of fact, it's always interesting when we go to meet with a major client and Mike's there and he already knows them because he used to handle their accounts. We have five major divisions, um, permitting assistance, small business, international trade, CalBiz, my unit, California Business Investment Services, and innovation and entrepreneurship. We also have some internal ones, legislation and communication. Um, this next slide talks about the California economy. Uh, in several areas of the state, we are starting to see some turnaround. Unemployment is uh, getting to a more manageable number. Uh, housing prices are starting to um, Housing prices are going real hot right now in some areas of the state. We realize, though, the state is very diverse, and just because we're seeing success in one area doesn't mean we're successful everywhere, and that's one of the things we're working to do, work with our partners to make sure that we can assist and see what can be done. Um, one of the things we're focusing on is retention, not only attraction. We're looking to help our existing businesses that are here. That's one of the reasons why... Uh, uh, we're, we were very supportive of PG&E and their economic development rate. Uh, we're happy to work with Khaled whenever we can working with businesses. I first met Cruz, actually, when she came to our offices uh, when we were going uh, to assist one of the local businesses to talk about things that could be done. So companies, big and small, we're, we're will, willing to work with them. We're ready to work with them. I've worked with everything from major airplane manufacturers to computer companies, software companies, and dog food manufacturers. So it doesn't matter. We handle it all. One of the things that's on this slide is the one-stop. We are really trying to be the one-stop. Um, our permitting assisting office, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, has been uh, working very hard to work with consolidated permitting in some areas. So rather than a business having to come in and get one permit and then another and then another, it's trying to get those people together, have one of them become the lead agency, and then work through the whole system to truncate it so it's easier for the business and it's also easier uh, for the different entities, the different agencies. Um, one of the things the permit assistance team has been working on uh, is a consolidated permit to work with dairy digesters. In the Central Valley, it's very key, uh, trying to get the whole infrastructure, the air, water, and then the local permitting all together. The initial discussions on that took about 18 months, and then it was determined who was going to be the lead entity. It doesn't mean that the other agencies' questions aren't being addressed, it's just one is the lead, and then everybody handles it. And therefore, the company doesn't have to answer the questions over and over again. We, myself and my co part my coworkers, were working with about five different digester companies that are looking to do projects in California, and uh, some are, are in the Central Valley looking. Um, very few have actually pulled the trigger at this point. There, there's several issues we're still trying to work through. Also on this slide, I'd like to bring everyone's attention to CalGold. That's a website that had been around for a while at Trading Commerce and then at uh, Cal EPA. It was updated uh, by our, our unit. Um, when they first looked at how outdated it was, they decided it was going to take about three years to get it done. Uh, they brought in a team of college interns, and within six months they turned it around and it was all up to date. You can type in your community's name and what you want to do, and it will list all the permits that that business would have to be uh, aware of and interested in. It's a very good tool for us. Our small business office, our Barbara Vorjak is the small business advocate, and she is um, working with our Office of Small Business, which is now since um, July 1st shifted over from BTNH to the end of the auspices of our office. She's been carrying many um, carrying on many events throughout the state, one with a brown bag to discuss some issues, and then she's also been doing um, coffee cup. So you get in, talk about an issue. One was actually on the, the new health care initiative, and it's been very successful. They've been doing it in Northern California, Southern California, 
we have one staff member that's outsourced in uh, Southern California, and then two up here in our office. Innovation, the uh, iHubs, there's 12 of them in the state. There's an application right now for three more. Lewis Stewart is our uh, our guru of innovation. You'll know Lewis if we're in a, a meeting together, we kind of do a Mutt and Jeff routine because he's 6'8 and a former uh, basketball player, and I'm not 6'8 and I'm not a former basketball player. But he's been very innovative in looking at things that can be done. Uh, one of the things that he... Uh, has been working on is there's a community that has a need for a, a a center. And so what he's been doing is trying to identify buildings that are state-owned, that are close to the uh, campuses of local high schools so that they can be used for that because it's in the, uh, the IHUB. And of course, under state law, you can't lease or rent at a reduced rate. Everything has to be done at market rate. And so they're looking for a special exemption for IHUBs for that. And that's one of the things he's been spearheading. International trade, uh, there was just an announcement the other day. We have uh, named our new deputy director for international trade. He'll be starting in a few months. We have two people on staff now. Matter of fact, we had a meeting this morning uh, with a Japanese company that was coming in. We had uh, some representatives from CalBiz, and we had uh, a team of people there from FTB because they had very technical, specific questions they wanted to know answers to from FTB about how their company would be treated, how it would be taxed, and they had five people there to address it, and we were able to answer all the questions. Um, last week, we met with an Italian company, and we have a current RFP out um, that Esther has received, and Cam has it. And one of our roles is we send them to the ED, to the uh, utilities, but I haven't sent it to you yet, but not PG or PG or Sotel at um, But it's a very small one. It's only 10 jobs. Uh, they're only looking for 10,000 square feet to get started, and they identified the Central Valley and a, and a couple other areas. So we send that out to the EDC, and then they go out to the communities and ask what's available and we'll see what happens. Um, it's kind of an interesting one. I, it's my first project I'm working with a company from Jordan, so hopefully we'll be able to do something. Another thing that our folks at um, International Trade is they work with the EV5 program. That's a federal program. One of the things we do is certify the areas as uh, economically distressed or targeted employment area for their for their nomenclature. Communications and policy. Um, one of the things that they have done, I'm going to step out of camera for a second, is they have come up with some reports. This one is on our website, and that will be coming up later. And this is giving a... Um, narrative of all the changes to the new economic development program. It's on our website. Anybody can download it. It explains all of it. One of the key factors of that is the sales and use tax credit in an enterprise zone is, is going away. It's no longer to a specific area. The new part is it is a tax exemption. So if you're a manufacturing firm, if you're an R&D, or if you're in food processing and you're putting new equipment in, you get an exemption off the front end. When you start to discuss that with companies, they realize they're going to be getting about 4.19% off the front end that, that would have been a tax rather than getting a tax credit and then having to wait till they burn through their debt, they um, become profitable, and then they have to start to pay taxes. That's usually five to seven years down the road. So this, we feel, is a very positive step. It's money off the front end. We're also coming up with the Yes, Cruz. <laughs> Um, Cruz asked the question with the trans, uh, and I'll paraphrase it, with the transition from the existing program into the new one, uh, how is that going to be structured? How is the application going to be different? And essentially, the enterprise zone itself as a uh, boundary will continue for the hiring tax credit, for the new hiring tax credit. Um, and then also the state's 25 most distressed areas are also in there. So in some cases, we're going to have some overlap. And we're expecting probably somewhere in the beginning of the fourth quarter, those maps will be, become public. Um, there are three main parts to it. The sales tax exemption, that's going to be managed by Board of Equalization. And they are working to come up with the, I'll call it an application, because if you're a company and you're buying equipment, you need to clear it with them so you can get the paperwork from them so your seller who's selling you the equipment knows that you're exempt. 
a hiring tax credit. Um, it is set at $12 or above. So if you're paying someone $12, that's where it starts and it caps out at $28 an hour. And it, it goes through a, a formula. And I will forward the missing um, Esther what the formula is. It, it's essentially that amount of money. So if it's $8, it's 8 times 2,000 hours. And then that over a year and then 35% of it. So it's for 18, for $20 an hour, it works out to about $16,000 over a five-year period. But when you start to get up to the higher dollar amounts, like 28, it's around 56000 And unlike the old Enterprise Zone one, it doesn't go 50%, 40%, 30%. It's a straight amount, straight across. I'll get there. Um, for companies that are using the program now, they will continue to be able to take the credits on the, on the workers they have hired or if they've amassed them. Now, typically, it would end at about a five-year period, but through the legislation, they've extended that for a 10-year period after that. So if a company has amassed credits and they haven't used them, they have up to 10 years to use them. And on Monday, um, we're actually, uh, my director is coming down, Kish Rajan, and he will be making the presentation first with the Central Valley Group at the offices of the Fresno Eating Seat. And then he'll be in Fresno later to meet with some of the city officials there. So you have two opportunities to try to, to catch the, the presentation. That is our, uh, that's the end of my presentation. I think those on time cam didn't have to wave me down. And then the last thing I'll do is, um, this is also from our communications folks and for the California Compete, which is the third part of our, the new economic development program. It's a Q&A on all the questions we've been receiving so far. So the three parts, again, are the, the new sales tax credit, uh, excuse me, the sales tax exemption that will start July 1st, 2014. The hiring tax credit will start January 1st, 2014, and California Competes starts January 1st, 2014. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about it because then it will be duplicative when Kish gets here, and then I'll get in trouble when I get back to Sacramento. Any questions? Everyone, that if you're interested in attending the workshop on Monday with the governor's office, uh, Kish Rajan, uh, please make sure yes. to go to uh, Fresno EDC website under business services and workshops to register. Okay, so you have to register. So go on our website and register if you want to come to the meeting on Monday. Thanks. We'll also send out the link uh, to everybody's email that way they have it. <laughs> It's kind of creepy to see yourself on this little square. I don't know what you guys are seeing in Orange Cove, but okay. Well, good evening, everyone. So I hope you're ready. We're going to have some economic development fun. I know you can't see the folks on this side, but they're ready. They look excited. Orange Cove people, you look like you're getting excited. I see all the movement. Good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, woohoo! So I know that part of you or some of you participated in a session last time, which was kind of the basics of economic development. So we're going to do a brief recap of that, but talk about what's next. Did somebody have a question? Or is that just wrestling? Okay, so this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to do the uh, quick recap of what is economic development. What's next? And we're going to talk about partners, resources, school tactics, and then how you measure success. I'm, I'm so excited. It's economic development. And we're in Fresno County. <laughs> okay, so first let me tell you a little bit about Khaled. Um, as you were going around doing your introductions, I feel weird. I can't see you, but just know I'm there. I know you're there. Um, Khaled has been around for about 32 years. We have over 750 members. Most of them are cities and county staff that do our economic development. Uh, what we're seeing now with the loss of redevelopment and the budget issues at the local level, those positions that used to be economic development and redevelopment positions are now being moved up into the city manager's office. So it might be that we're working with the city manager or that we're working with a, uh, you know, a higher level staff person or someone that's not familiar with economic development or maybe a planning person. So we're seeing the, the position shift quite a bit. But we do have a new directory. It's going to be mailed to you. And if you can't see it, it's beautiful and bright. There's some copies here for those of you who are here. Um, the other thing about Khaled, you know, our primary goal is really to be, one, your voice at the state level. So to advocate on your behalf. But two, 
also to do education. We're so pleased to partner with PG&E and the Fresno EDC to be here because this is an opportunity for us to get out and really share the message of what is economic development, what's happening across the state, what are some trends, and, and what are some tools that you can re you can benefit from, you know, things that we're hearing out there. One of the things that we're starting new next year in 2014, we're going to have a series of free trainings for CalEd members. So every month there will be a different topic that we do a free training on. It will most likely be a webinar. A couple of them are conference calls. But there's a handout. It looks like this. You don't have it in Orange Cove, but I'll get it to Lorena. So we'll get it emailed to you. And then for the folks here, there's copies. But again, this is a great way for us to educate everyone, share the same message on economic development. Now, I, I talked a little bit about Khaled and who we are. So I'm going to go kind of quickly because I want to get to the meat of this. I'm hoping that my presentation leads you into a really thoughtful conversation of what you want to do next at the city level or as a group collectively with your economic development strategies and goals. So for those of you, how many did participate or hear Wayne's presentation last time? Hands up. Orange Cove? Nobody? Oh, a few. Okay, great. So just take a couple of seconds to write down, I'm not going to ask you to share it, but write down what you think is your definition of economic development. I can see you Orange Cove people. <laughs> really quickly. <laughs> And then as a follow-up to that, what do you think it means to your community? So, and the reason I'm asking you to do that is because I want you to notice if you share afterwards, whether it's during the roundtable or just in general conversation, I think you're going to find that you probably wrote down something different from your neighbor, or maybe you look at what your neighbor wrote down and copied it. But a lot of what we're hearing across the state is economic development is about jobs. Right? Who does not care about jobs? Well, I'm going to say something really selfish. It's about revenue generation for communities as well. To me, and, and that comes first, right? You have to have a sustainable economic base in your community so you can provide the services your residents expect. Jobs are a benefit of that as you're working with business. But when you're doing economic development, that's not always your primary goal, and it's important that you understand that. And I know you got a lot of that from me last time, so I'm not going to go into it in real detail, but. From a city or, or public perspective, it's about allocation of limited resources so that you can have a positive effect on the level of business activity, employment, income distribution patterns, and fiscal solvency. I'm going to talk about fiscal solvency quite a bit because it's the piece that gets lost. When you hear communities going into bankruptcy, that's just sad. We focus so much on where can we cut the budget, you know, what can we cut, what positions, where can we take money and move from here to there. What about the revenue side? How do we bring revenue into the community? And that's really what economic development is about, the creation of wealth. So I'm going to share the second point with you because I've heard it a lot, and I've found that as I share it with people, they say, yeah, that's our experience, too. We had a member from Southern California, one of our cities, share that what they believe is the 80-20 rule. And what they said is that when they look at where their income comes, 80% of the income that the city receives come from business-type revenue, although the businesses only require 20% of the services. And the flip side of that is that residents require 80% of the services but only contribute 20% of the revenues that come into the city. Now, when you look at your budget, how does it look for you? And it might be different. It might be that, you know, it's 50-50 or it's not, but that's not what we're hearing. And part about the thing about economic development is if you're helping your businesses thrive, hopefully they can contribute more, and that way you have better coffers and you can, again, provide better services for your residents. And that's what it's about. It's about creating healthy communities, wealthy communities, not just about jobs. Okay, so what's next? You guys all know the definition of economic development. You know that it's about wealth creation. It's more than jobs. What's the next thing you do? Anybody want to throw out an answer? Have a party? Have a workshop? Okay. We're going to talk about what's next. So, it, first of all, economic development is not a one-size-all fits or fits-all proposition. And I say that because what we see statewide is communities looking at neighboring communities or communities hearing stories about what another community is doing and saying, I want to do that. Well, just because they're doing it doesn't mean that it makes sense for your community. Economic development might have a big, broad definition of being about wealth creation, but what it means to you locally could be very different 
and what it means to another community, and it's important that you know that. It was really great to hear um, Leanne talk about the assets you have. The assets you have are going to be different than your neighboring community. Even city by city, they're going to differ, but also your threats and your weaknesses. It's important that you're honest with yourself and you know those things as well. So for me, what's next, I'm going to talk really big picture. And again, I hope that this, it might seem like it's common sense, but from what we're seeing, it's not necessarily common sense. So we're going to talk big picture about ways that we think people can get on the same page and how they can move forward when it comes to economic development. First, you do have to have a leadership mindset. It's great that you're all here. You're in Orange Cove. You're paying attention because it means that you care. You, know, you want to do something for your community. You're engaged in economic development. But beyond that, you know, be strategic. You can't be everything to, every, to everyone. You have limited resources. I mean, if we all had a ton of money, we wouldn't be here talking about economic development. You have limited resources, so be strategic with them. Think beyond boundaries. We know that we hear regionalism. We don't always see regionalism in practice when we get into the local communities and we start hearing the conversations about some of the local politics. I mean, think beyond your boundaries. Just because a business moves to a neighboring community doesn't mean you don't benefit from that. So how can you work together? Collaborate. You're not alone. You heard a lot from Leanne about some of the partners that they work with, pg e Dovis. There's a lot of folks that are in your communities already that are using metrics or that are in place because their goal is to help a business. So collaborate with them. You don't have to do it all by yourself. And then leverage, leverage, leverage. Look at what your partners are doing. Can you build off that? Can that help you with your economic development goals as well? Know what you have. So this is key. Something that we see happen a lot, and more so with people that are newly introduced to economic development, they get it, they're excited, you're hearing about it, you want to move forward, you want to do something right now because now you know what it is you need to do. But from our perspective, probably the most important thing that you can do as a leader is know what you have. Because lots of times, it's not that you don't have the right pieces, maybe they need coordination, maybe they need a champion, maybe you have an ace bunch of resources in your community, but you don't know it. So start there. Know what you have. Economic Development Corporation is a great place to start. Economic Development Partners and Resources that you may not be aware of. I'm going to talk about some. I'm also going to talk a little bit about a strategy and then the need to measure what it is that you're working on. So it's great to have a strategy that you do have to implement and you do have to measure. It's not enough to just say we have a strategy and then put it on a shelf for a few years when you're ready to um, do the update. So Leanne talked quite a bit about the EDC. I'm not going to go into any more depth than that other than you have a great resource. And when she talks about their Fair Action Network, let me tell you, it's amazing. We, we have a JPA, Joint Powers Authority, that does bond issuance and finance for business. And we were part of the Bear Network. They had so many calls, we could not keep up. I mean, they are on it when it comes to helping their businesses. Devin finally broke up with us and dumped us off their Bear Action Network. But just to say that they do have this wealth of resources, so why not tap in? instead of going it alone on your own. This slide, hopefully you have the handout. These are a list of partners that we got from the EDC that they work with. I'm not going to go over them, and the intent wasn't to you know, overwhelm you with tiny font, but it was to give you a sense of there's a lot of people out there that are focused, that are partnering in the county to support economic development. And the, probably, like I said, the most important thing you can do as a leader is know what they're doing and know how they can help you. Now, it was my intent to go over a few of these, but I don't know that I have the time. I'm going to look at Pam for that. Now, okay, so we've talked about GoBiz, um, CalBiz. We have this great presentation from Patrick. Thank you. Calic, we're not just a resource when it comes to sharing information like this and to doing training. We also get grants to work in communities. We had EDA grants. Some of you probably worked with Wayne when he was with Calic. You've come down with EDA and some other um, federal agencies that can finance projects and talk to you about what projects you have. How can we finance them? So we do work in your communities as well. And when we do, we try to reach out to your economic developers first so it's not just Cal coming into your community, but we're working in partnership with you. Brokers and site selectors. So I highlighted a few that I thought you know people might not think of first when they think about economic development. Except for the EDC folks, um, who knows why a broker and a site selector would be important for economic development? Land acquisition, one for sure. Um, the other reason is they know what businesses are moving, right? Those are their clients. 
You're talking to businesses every day that are either looking for space or they're moving. That's important to you because not every company can afford a site selector. In fact, I believe is it the statistic of less than 10% actually use site selectors? So who's your next best resource? Your local broker. They know where that movement is. And they might be able to tell you before anyone else can, hey, this business is moving. Or, look, this business has contacted me. They're looking for space in your city. So it's really important that you use that network, that you connect with them. Um, and let me see. Ooh, you guys can see me. That's scary. Um, Wells Fargo. <laughs> Let's talk about Wells Fargo as a partner. So banks are your partners for sure. We talk a lot about the fact that, you know, the bank, banks aren't supporting business loans right now. They're sweet spot. They're trying to lend too high. So if you have a small business, that's looking for a smaller size loan, where do you go? Well, one of the things that banks do do to meet their CRA, their Community Reinvestment Act requirement, is contribute to other not, um, revolving fund non-bank lenders. Revolving fund non-bank lenders. So you'll, you might have partners that have revolving loan funds that can lend to your businesses. Oftentimes, they've gotten that money from banks such as Wells Fargo, and they're trying to lend, and they're mission-based lenders. So their underwriting criteria are not as strict, and they're trying to lend because they're, they have a mission they're trying to meet. So it's usually easier to get funding from them. Oftentimes, they'll require a bank turndown letter, but many times that funding is coming directly from a bank that couldn't help your business. So you do want to know if you have banks in your community, where are they investing those funds for their Reinvestment Act credit? Where are they putting those funds? Because they could contribute them towards economic development and help you. The university system, Cal State, Fresno, or Fresno State University that you have here, we partner with them on a week-long course for the basics to economic development. They're a great resource, though. They also have a rural initiative. They're working with a lot of small communities. So again, a really good resource that you can tap into. The other thing that we see communities do with these types of universities that are engaged in economic development is ask those universities for students or interns or ask them to do studies. So let's say you want to do a market analysis of some sort of your community. You can't necessarily afford to bring in someone large like Buxton, but hey, you've got this university, you've got interns, they're doing a business study, they need experience, maybe they can help you. So a great resource to tap in there as well, especially when they already have an economic development focus. Workforce connection, workforce is a huge issue across the state. I would say that one of the things that California has that other states don't have is such a highly skilled workforce that sometimes it's hard to match those skills with the job opportunities. You know, over the past few years when unemployment has been high, what we've heard is, look, their jobs, they're just not educated or qualified people that can fit those jobs. So know who your workforce partners are. And again, the folks that I'm talking about on, these, on this slide are people that the Fresno EDC is already connected with. So if you have questions, tap into your EDC and say, look, who are you working with on this issue? So I'm going to skip the, the next one. Well, let me mention Kaiser Permanente. If you're not working with your health care provider, and this comes from my experience with the California State Rural Health Care Association, when we were working with rural communities, one thing we found is that health care or the institutions that were providing health weren't necessarily seen as economic development drivers in the community, but they are. Well, oftentimes, they're the largest employer. So what we heard, the issues that came up over and over again in the healthcare field were, look, we can't get qualified staff. People are getting educated here, and they're leaving. Now, a lot of concerns about we don't have access. We need telemedicine, but we don't have broadband. The roads are poor. We can't get people in and out of the clinics or to the clinics. A lot of economic development issues, so if you're not connecting to your healthcare folks, partner with your EDC to do it, or just check in and see what they're working on. So I know that was a lot of information. I could talk all day just on this slide, but the intent is just to give you a flavoring of there's a lot going on right now in your community, in your county. You should take some time to, to figure out a few of the resources. I put this slide in separate, access to capital, and the reason it's in there by itself is because access to capital is still identified as the number one barrier to businesses expanding in the state. So what we try to talk about is what are other places, non-traditional resources, where businesses can go to get financing, and I've put a few up there that you can look at. I'm happy to talk to you about those as well, but the one I'm going to point to at the bottom, Cal4, the Access to Capital Guidebook. If you haven't seen that, USDA, Glenda, Dr. Glenda Humiston led the charge on that. It's like a 100-page document on resources for where you can get access to capital for businesses and for projects. 
It's a great resource book. If you don't have it, it's on the CalEd website. We can also, if you don't have it on yours, we can share the link with the EDC to send that to you all as well. Okay, have a current strategy and measure outcomes. I'm sure that at your last thing that you, or the last round table like this, you talked a lot about the need for a strategy. So what strategies are already out there? And I'm going to ask you all because I know that you're more familiar with them than I am. So before you go out and recreate a new one, which strategy, strategy do you all know already exists? Do, is there a regional one? CCB EDC has a regional strategy. The San Joaquin Partnership has a, a long, big regional strategy for all the counties, right? Is there a county strategy? Yes. Do the cities have strategies? Orange Cove, Sanger, do you all have economic development strategies? Yes. Good. Okay. Kind of. Good, too. <laughs> now, <laughs> um, great. Okay, so your city will have an uh, ED strategy. How many of you are familiar with your Workforce Investment Board strategy? A lot of them right now are going through industry cluster analysis and have to come up with their strategies as well. Some have engaged the economic development partners in, at the local level, some have not. So if you're not familiar with it, if nothing else, you should know what they're doing because they've already done a, an analysis of the industries and the workforce available in this area. So important for you to know. And then some of you have said um, community economic develop or I'm sorry, comprehensive economic development strategies so that you can get EDA funding. So a lot of strategies, do they all come together? Are they all looking at what the other strategy is doing to see if they're augmenting or supporting? I see a no. I would agree with you, no. So before you head down the path of creating a new strategy, whether it's for your city or you know, maybe a few cities getting together as a collaborative, or you want to look at what the county is doing, you know, make sure you know what's already there. There might be something in place that just needs implementing and updating, or maybe you need to pull these folks together and say, you know, President EDC is the leader, pull everyone together and say, look, you've got all these strategies. Can we all get on the same page so we're moving in the same direction? Now, that doesn't mean locally you should not have your own strategy, because what you want to accomplish at the city might not be what the county wants to, but maybe there's a way you can partner and you have shared goals. So you do individually, as a city, need to know what it is that your goals are, what it is you're trying to achieve. But the goal, again, is to know whatever, what else is out there and how can you partner, are there ways to leverage the work. And some questions that would say, you know, what is your community value? Do they want big businesses? Do they want small businesses? Do they value, you know, having a quiet community? They really don't want a lot more retail. Maybe they want a manufacturer, but they want way out of town, so they're not close. But know what your community values are. Do you, know, you have a competitive advantage? Again, going back to assets, do you have something that nobody else has or something that you have that's just extraordinary that businesses would want or residents would want? That's important to know. What businesses will your residents support? You know, we hear a lot about big box. People don't want big box. They love big box. They just want it outside of town. Um, that's important to know. We hear that, and we hear it. We see it come up in legislation over and over again. You know, the issue of do we want a big box store, and where do we want it? Do we want it in our community? But what businesses will your residents support? What are your weaknesses? Be honest with yourself. What we hear communities do is talk very positively about all the great things they have. And I'm not saying go out there and tell everybody, oh, my gosh, we don't have infrastructure, we have no money, we have no workforce, we can't help you. But that's something you should know. You should know going into it what you do and don't have, because the last thing you want to do is make a promise to a business and then not be able to deliver once they've moved or made a decision to come to your community. And then also you want to know your weaknesses so you can work on them. They might be things that you can improve or you can work with other folks on or other partners in the community. And then what are your end goals? This to me is the most important thing because when we talk about metrics for economic development, we've talked a lot nationally about a standard set of, of metrics. And jobs always comes up as one of the top things. How many jobs did you save? How many jobs did you create? Well, more than that, what other metrics? And to me, I think metrics are very specific. They can't just be across the board, everyone's being touched by the same thing when it comes to economic development, because what your city is trying to accomplish might not be what someone else is trying to accomplish. So look at your end goals and work back from that in terms of what your metrics should be. 
Um, this is a slide, if you want, I can talk about it in the question and answer session. Just some ways of um, getting projects done. And I have some other samples. I know you have the, the handout, so I'm not going to go through these. But sample activities under business retention and expansion and creation, as well as business attraction. I won't go into those. We can talk about them in the question and answer session. But I just wanted you to get a flavor of some that, were, that folks use primarily. So as you're thinking about, look, our focus is only business retention. Let's say that's what you have identified as a goal. You don't want to work on attraction. You want to know what kind of things are other communities doing. There's some examples. You're certainly welcome to reach out to us. Of course, reach out to the EDC and find out what they know your partner cities are doing. But um, just some examples for your reference. And then measuring success. So I'm going to come back to this piece and just talk a little bit about it. Economic development is an investment. right? It's not just, it's strange to me when I hear communities say, we're doing a 10% cut across the board. It doesn't matter. Well, economic development is your revenue generator. Why would you cut your revenue generator at a time that your budget might be struggling? I mean, why would you cut your revenue generating arm ever um, unless you absolutely had to? But I think it's something that at the local level, if you want to show leadership on, if you can show leadership on, is be the voice of the value of economic development. I mean, it's addressing the revenue side of your budget, not just addressing where you can cut in the expense side. And the metrics being specific. So here are some um, acute little things, smart to help you figure out you know, how you can devise some metrics based on your end, end game, your end goals. And I'm sure that you all have some that you use as well. But just to give you an idea of how you can work backwards from your goal to define what some of the metrics are that you want to work with. So as you go back now, after hearing me and you know, taking into account what you heard from the prior presenters, so what is economic development? And what does it mean to your community? I think if you can clearly define that, that really helps you in terms of figuring out what your next steps are beyond knowing who's already there, who's already working in your community. So that is my final slide. Um, I could talk forever about economic development because it's exciting. I can tell everyone here is excited. Orange Cove, excited. So um, unless there's some questions right now, I think I'm going to turn it back to Leanne. You're going to uh, do a question and answer around people. Hearing none, thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And if uh, any of you haven't gone to any CalEd um, conferences, make sure you do that because the work that they do is amazing and you get a lot out of it going to those workshops. Um, so now we'll open it up to questions and answers. Um, if you have any questions after all of that information, uh, that you heard from everyone here. If you have any additional questions, um, now is the time to speak now or forever old to be. Got anything out there in Orange Cove? Are you still awake out there? Yeah. Uh, I, have, I have a quick question. Uh, what's the best way to, uh, we have a economic development strategy or market plan for the city of Orange Cove, but it needs updating. It was done in 2005. What's the best way to do it? We've spoken to Fresno State, um, and assisting us with that plan, and there's a cost associated to that, and I'm just not sure that we can afford it. Um, but is there a different approach that we can take as a city to uh, to update our, our plan just through workshops and uh, things like that? So, you, I'm sorry, did you say that you're already working with Fresno State or you were talking to Fresno State? Yeah, I've been working with Mike Dozier, uh, and he's yeah. in uh, Edina. Um, and so they've given us a, a price for... Uh, in, in economic development strategic plan, um, and there's a you know a process that they they've uh, that they have in mind in, for Orange Cove, but there's a cost mm -hmm. associated to it, and I'm just not sure that we can afford it. Um, but is there anything else that uh, you've seen out there um, that we can potentially use here for our city for a small rural community like us? You know, there's a couple that I've seen where the communities actually did it themselves; they didn't use a consultant. And Mike Dozier is a good partner and a good friend. And he's on my board. Don't tell him I told you. <laughs> so, yes. So the first one is if you look at the town of Windsor, I think theirs is still up on the website. It's a very small community. But they did their strategy in-house. It's excellent in terms of laying out. It talks about the process that they went through, as well as what their goals were, timeline, and metrics. That's a very comprehensive one. Surprised they did it in-house, but it was a good one. 
And they might have used someone to help them with data, though, and that might be where, you know, Mike and Ishmael can really help you. Another example of an in-house strategy Mike Dozier did when he was with the city of Clovis. So you, that might be a good one to look at as well. And then um, County of Ventura has one that they just completed. They used their planning staff and an economic development staff person to do it. That one's really current. I believe they just did, released it a few months ago. Again, great in terms of talking about what the goals are. They, they have a lot of agriculture in their county as well, talking about the goals, the metrics, and the timeline of how they're going to get there. So if you're trying to do it in-house, those are really good models. If you want to see if there's a more competitive price out there, if you send us an RFP, we can send it out to all of our private sector members and have them to respond to you directly. And that way you can gauge where Mike's price is alongside some of the others. I will say in talking to Mike, it sounded like they were trying to charge as little as possible because they wanted to make it a community service. Thank you. Sorry, you're welcome. <laughs> and, and I can just add, too, if you want to check on the um, Fresno County website, they were just updating their economic development strategy. And right now you can see what the old one looked like and what some of the things are changing um, for the new strategy. So um, it's a good process to look at on, on what kinds of things they're changing. And I can send you that link if you need it. Thank you, Dan. Sure. Got anything else over there? Come on, Glenda. I know you're there. <laughs> yeah. Anyone have any an orange cove that would like to share? Just it's been great working with EDC and uh, with the economic development growth that we've had here in Orange Cove. And it's uh, thanks to uh, to Esther and Leanne and Devin and everybody else, Victor as well. Um, and we've been talking about some other stuff that uh, we've done out here. Um, with uh, Victor uh, Manuel Ferrer in the chamber, we actually walked our, our businesses to try to gauge what our business needs were for uh, sustainability and retention. Um, and we walked individually to every single business in the city uh, downtown, what our downtown, we don't have a, a designated downtown, but uh, we walked uh, the businesses and just talked to every single one, you know, what's your need, what, uh, what are you looking for, do you want to expand, are you looking for capital for, uh, more employees, whatever the case might be, and then we set up meetings uh, individually with them, and we have, actually have a study. We're going to have a, a Victor come back to uh, to the council and, and uh, kind of present that back and say, what's next for, for Orange Cove now that we have this, this data uh, for our local business, our current business here in our city. So that's that's been uh, great working with EDC with uh, on several different projects that we have in our city. Thank you. Um, and I know they've been doing great work out there in Orange Cove, and it's been a pleasure to, to work with you and your community. Um, how about you folks? You have folks from Sanger out there, right? Yes. What are you doing out there, Dan? Well, there's, there's quite a few things. Uh, we have a lot of housing activity. Um, from, from a uh, standstill two years ago when the council instituted some uh, incentive programs that that tied uh, fee reductions to buying from local businesses, and uh, that was attractive enough to get six developers back into the city. So we have we have six subdivisions under construction now. But the you know the real benefit, other than getting nice new neighborhoods, is that those builders are using our local businesses, and we've seen increases in. Uh, building and construction materials, for example, 189 uh, percent year over year, and um, it's it, it's had the added impact of creating the jobs, but mainly it's bringing wealth back into the community or keeping it there, and uh, and again we get rid of our blighted neighborhoods at the same time. Uh, we have a really nice um, health facility project that's. Um, probably going to be announced within the next two or three weeks. It will be um, a major downtown development. Uh, we haven't had much development in our downtown for probably 40, 50 years. Uh, but this year we completed a, a 53 suite office complex and um, we're again right in downtown. And the new health facility will be right across the street from there. So we're, uh, we're 
pulling people back into the downtown, which will translate into more profitable uh, businesses along Main Street and the side streets. No, that's so, great. It's just a couple of things. Yeah. Yeah, good news. Anything from Mendota we want to share? <laughs> You want to come tell them? They're going to come talk to you a little bit about their own economic development strategy. Hi again, I'm Matt, uh, City Clerk, City of Mendota. Um, just so you know, uh, Orange Club, we did our own uh, economic development plan, and uh, we can't say it's uh, perfect or maybe even good, I don't know, but it's something that, again, we went back to that same idea that we don't have a lot of resources. Again, like Chris pointed out, it, it's kind of a rural, small city thing. We don't have the staff to be able to execute a lot of this stuff, so we just figured, you know, we can't just sit around and do nothing. Um, so we just decided to do our own. And it's going to be one of those things, again, as we're able to possibly in the future get staff or do other things, we're going to probably be tweaking it and, uh, you know, adjusting some things so that it does work for us. But um, other than that, we're working on getting the uh, industrial park. Uh, that's kind of in the future, uh, hopefully in the near future the sooner the better, uh, something we definitely need. And uh, also uh, we plan on pretty soon going out and walking uh, all the businesses uh, in that same way that was discussed earlier and trying to assess in their needs and everything. Um, so there's a lot of that going on. Anything else? Thank you. Anything good? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Uh -huh. and, and just so you know, it, when you go out and do those door-to-door, -door, um, EDC has staff to knock on those doors with you and help you collect all that information. <laughs> he volunteered Esther, and she said no. Um, <laughs> but Devin and his team, and Victor and his team will help you. So they do. With, you know. Marina, there you go. <laughs> All right. Yes, please. And the question from Cruz was, the, those of you over there on the east side, you have the five cities JPA that got together because you understood that you had issues that were common amongst all of you. And, you know, a, a good way to address those issues is to meet monthly and to talk about what things you have in common. Over here on the west side, there used to be a I-5 um, yeah, that they met, um, but I think that it didn't happen very often. So um, we have been talking to the folks on the west side um, about putting something together over here. So if we want to set that up again to try to get that done, um, if all of you are in agreement that you'd like us to, to try to get that together, we, we can certainly coordinate that for you, which they would. So go ahead. And Glenda has a question. Okay. Yay, Glenda. Go ahead. <laughs> I want to tell you I'm really thankful that um, you are helping Orange Cove. I think that your your uh, EDC is probably the greatest investment, if not the number one investment, that Orange Cove has made to help us with our corporate businesses, and you really understand us. The question I have, and I'm not quite sure if you have the answer, could think about it. How can you help small rural communities, especially Orange Cove, to raise or increase our social economic standards that would help generate the business. But there's something that needs to be added into the component of Orange Cove that has not yet been tapped, and it's in the social economic um, standards or the level, whether it's in their, their um, job. It, it's something there. So I just want you to think about that because there's something okay. there that's missing for us. You know, because we do not have uh, the roads. We have the Highway 63 or, or Hills Valley, but, you know, that's like a gateway going up to the mountains. But we need something in the inside of us before we can be attracting from the outside. All our minds are saying that's what we want to do, but there's some missing components with inside of us. Yeah. Esther just reminded me, we think, of course, and we talked about this before, Glenda, what we what you really need is that orange festival. 
I've been talking about this forever, that Orange Cove, of course, should have a Orange Festival. If Gilroy has the Garlic Festival, and we grow it here, excuse me, Orange Cove, who grows it and processes it, should certainly have the Orange Festival. And if you need our help in getting that going, we're 100% behind it. But yeah, we can talk about some of those things that we need okay. to do for our individual communities to look at what are your assets that we need to, to really expand on. And, you know, I, I think you're right. In, in most of our communities, whether you're giant Fresno or some of our smaller communities, that it, it really is um, we have to look inside ourselves first on what is it that we can do better, what is it that we need to look at and be proud of what we have also, and then start um, expanding on those. Okay. Thank you. We'll, get, we'll talk. Okay. You got it. Yes, true. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, we're, we were talking about, um, Cruz had brought up that we really need to bring our educational facilities here, whether it's the school districts or the colleges. And I know out in Orange Cove we did that um, last year. Is um, We had the school districts and we had Fresno City and Fresno State at a meeting, but maybe at a larger meeting where we, we bring those folks in and talk about the importance um, of education in all of our communities. You're absolutely right. Anybody have anything else? I have a, a quick question. Uh, we talked about uh, the global market and the, uh, as a, the Central Valley where, where, where our industry is ag. Um, as we compete now with uh, Southern South America, Chile, Argentina, uh, and I know I've read somewhere about uh, how Florida now is dealing with the challenge of, of uh, orange juice now being imported into Florida uh, because they're getting it cheaper from from uh, Chile and Argentina. Uh, have mm -hmm. we thought of uh, either uh, regionally here or also the state of how to deal with, with that uh, competition and what that does Patrick. to us in the Central Valley? Patrick, do you have anything from the state's perspective? Oh, we Patrick up here. Hi. We work with the... Um, California Department of Food and Ag, and if you're having specific examples, we usually work with Josh Eddy, and we can contact him and, and get some feedback. Patrick, does that fall under NAFTA at all with the juice? That I don't know. NAFTA, of course, is the federal uh, treaty. Okay. I know it, it does, you know, it's a good indicator for a lot of the ag that we, use, we now have to do the import-export but we didn't have two years ago. But. Hi, everyone. Is there any other questions? Any other questions? Well, and in closing, I want to thank everyone for, um, thank you. <laughs> in closing, I want to thank everybody for being here today. There we go. Um, and I do want to talk about our next upcoming session will be in a month from now, and we'll be talking about retention expansion and bringing additional partners as well to talk about business retention and expansion. After that, we will be talking about the business attraction component. Um, so again, what we're trying to do is really provide a drill down of all our services and bring in a lot of the partners and tools that are out there that can assist with these areas. So we look forward to you attending. If um, you would like to uh, host this uh, workshop again, please let us know. Orange Cove, thank you so much for hosting today. City of San Joaquin, thank you so much for hosting. Um, we look forward to our next workshop, and uh, Lorena and Juanita will be um, emailing all of you and giving you those phone calls just to remind you. And uh, we want to extend our invitation to any other city council members, mayors um, from our east side cities and um, our west side cities as well. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Esther. Thank you, Esther.